This morning, I want to kind of focus on our, our Mass, our Divine Liturgy. I want to talk about what our Sunday service, what it really is. Um, of course, it is Ember Friday, so on this Ember Friday, for the benefit of our postulates, for the benefit of our ordinance, and also for us, our deacon, the, the deacons and priests, what, what understanding what we are doing and what is happening in the divine liturgy, how it helps us to determine how we are to proceed in this work that we call worship. Our worship is God's service. It's God's service. It is a divine liturgy. It is a divine service. It is a mass. And that, that's more than just an odd name. It's a name set forth to help us remember each week what is happening in the our service. Namely, that God, that God is serving us. Our Old Testament text this morning follows uh, the, the section of Ezekiel in which God judges and God condemns his shepherds in Israel. The kings and the priests in Israel have been utterly, utterly unfaithful. They have failed to, to teach. They have failed to, to lead the people of God and to lead them aright. God likens, God, God likens their service to, to, to a shepherd eating his flock, scattering them instead of shepherding them, allowing all of the beasts of the field to feed on the sheep as prey and not feeding the sheep, not leading the flock to a good pasture and not tending to the wounded among the flock. And God says, woe to them. Woe. For I am against the shepherds, the Lord says through the prophet Ezekiel. Then God later on declares that he himself will take over. He himself will take over. He will shepherd the sheep. He will feed them. He will take care, for, uh, take care of them. He will treat their wounds. He will treat their diseases. He will personally lead them to rest. And he promises good grazing ground. He promises abundant pastures on the mountain heights of Israel, healing, and he promises them strength. He will be their good shepherd. My friends, brothers, this is what we see. This is the promises that is fulfilled in our divine liturgy. This service is not simply something we do as a gift to God. I mean, it is surely that, but, but more importantly, it is God at work among us in his word and sacrament. He comes to us in his word, both in the reading of the lessons and, of course, the preaching of the word in the sermon and, and, and in the word which, which makes up our liturgy. And he, he strengthens us with it and he blesses us with it. He, he binds up our wounds with the comforts of the gospel and he heals our diseases with the precious gifts of the spirit. He comes to us in the collect of purity. He comes to us in the benediction. He, he promised that when the words of the benediction were spoken over his people, that his name would be placed on them. By that act. And that he would then come to his people and that he would bless them. He comes to us in the absolution. When, when the priest speaks those words, it is, it is the voice of God that you hear. It is the voice of God you hear. Of course, not God's natural voice as he sounds in the glories of heaven, but the voice which God has chosen by the divine call to use. In your parishes, by his priests, to speak his word of forgiveness and comfort. And of course, we are reminded of this 
in the ordinal when, when, the, when the bishop says, receive the Holy Ghost for the office and work of a priest in the church of God now committed unto thee by the imposition of our hands. Who sins thou dost forgive, they are forgiven. And who sins thou dost retain, they are retained. God comes to us through the preaching of his word. When the priest preaches, if what he preaches is the word of God, it is not simply his voice you hear. <coughs> Excuse me. It is not simply his voice you hear, but it is God's voice. It's the voice of God, and it's not just the priest's opinion. It's not a thus saith Steve victory. But it's God's word. Once again, within the ordinal, we're given the charge. Take thou authority to execute the office of a priest in the church of God, now committed to thee by the imposition of our hands. And be thou a faithful dispenser of the word of God. When you find that the priest has faithfully proclaimed the pure word of God, when you find that he has proclaimed the pure word of God, then it is the voice of God. It is the voice of God, and you must respond to it as God himself stood before you and spoke to you from the fires of a burning bush or from the face of Jesus Christ himself. cannot choose to believe or agree or not. You can't do that. You must accept the word of God and believe it or you are not a faithful child of God. In this divine liturgy, we worship God by repeating faithfully back to him the words that, that he has spoken to us. And in so doing, his words uh, to us come to our hearts and it comes to our ears again with fresh power and it renews us uh, in us uh, that which they worked in us at first. Uh, we have nothing better to offer God. Our words are not like his words. Our words are not packed in power, nor is it packed in truth, nor is it packed in glory. And so we speak what he has revealed to us back to him, declaring thereby that, that, that we believe his word and we trust him to do and perform all that he has spoken to us. And then, just as Ezekiel prophesied, the good shepherd feeds us. We find those pleasant pastures of the word. Like sheep, we feed on his promises as, remem as we remember all that he has done for us and his faithfulness of old. But most obviously, we fulfill that prophecy of God feeding his sheep when we feed on him, when we feed on the, the, the body and blood of his son in the sacrament. It is in the sacrament of the altar that Jesus comes to us and he feeds us. The good shepherd feeds us, giving us that body to eat, which, 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 which died on the cross for our sins and that blood to drink, which was poured out for our sins, that we might have life and that we might have salvation. Admittedly, of course, we do not see or taste that body or blood for Christ has chosen to hide them beneath the form of bread and wine in this holy meal. He has done that so that we might see it only by faith and receive the blessings which that body and that blood earned and purchased for us by believing. But they are really, they are genuinely present, tangibly present. They're there. The body and blood of Jesus are really present in this meal because <laughs> Jesus has said so and we can believe him and take him at his word. When we eat and drink, we receive him into ourselves and with his body and blood, all that he has won for us. The mountain heights in our text 
are the heights of absolution and forgiveness. One on a mountain, Mount Calvary. There, the very Son of God poured out his love for you by shouldering your sin, by shouldering my sin, and and willingly taking that punishment which we have each earned for ourselves. He died for our sins, nailed them to the cross with the wrath of God on that mountaintop in Israel. That mountain was small in stature, but it was world-shaking in significance. My friends, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. You will rise from the grave. And everyone who trusts in God to do what he has promised to do for the sake of all that Christ has done, he will rise or you will rise to everlasting life in glory with him. You can be sure, you can be sure, you can be secure, not in yourself, not in what you have done, but in Jesus Christ and what he has done. And the voice that you hear in the holy absolution is the voice of God, the voice he has chosen. And he is called here to speak his words of forgiveness and life to you. You receive that precious gift of life by taking God at his word spoken directly to you. Of course, knowing that, that faith calls for a response of life. We are compelled to live in that glorious truth when we believe it. We will rejoice and we will give thanks and we will strive to be the people of God that he has called us to be and and declared us to be and has made us to be in the blood and body of his son. We will strive by holy lives and by holy devotion and by repentance and by renewal. And by busying ourselves with the work he has given us to do, all the while proclaiming his great love and his wonderful will for us and for all mankind. Finally, there is a word of judgment in this prophecy. A word of judgment for those unfaithful shepherds and ancient Israel and for those among the sheep today who would feed on the flock of God. Ezekiel calls them fat and and the strong. They are the ones who, who, who take profit from the sheep and at the expense of the sheep, eating them and taking their milk in the words of Ezekiel in the verses just before or in the verses of of, of our text. False preachers are one example. Those who use their church and her people uh, for simple profit, or those who use their church and their people to, to build a kingdom of their own instead of Christ's kingdom. Or those who pretend to be one of the sheep for whatever reason they may have, claiming a place among the tender sheep of God. Those are the fat and the strong, and God has marked them out for destruction. He has marked them for destruction because they have grown fat on the sheep of God, using them for their own peace, their own power, for their own security, or whatever need has driven them to hypocrisy and vile manipulation of God's flock. But for us, for the faithful and humble sheep, God is our shepherd. God is our shepherd. God serves us here in our divine service. This is not worship to please our flesh, but to bless our spirit. It's not what you do for God, but what he does for you through word and sacrament, liturgy and and, and the fellowship of the people of God. And he does all this work through the service of his holy priesthood and his called servants who share in that priesthood as they lift high the cross and the glory of God in our salvation. This work is our work to lift 
high the glory of God in Christ Jesus. That he loves us. That he lived for us. That he died in our place for our sins. And that he rose again for our comfort and for our salvation. And the thrilling aspect of this worship is that it is the entire church worshiping together. We join with angels and with archangels and with all the company of heaven. And we say, and of course we say that in the preface of our liturgy. And we worship today. We stand side by side in the presence of those who have gone before us in the faith, joining with us, joining us with them in their worship in heaven. And I have to be reminded, I am never so close to my father who passed away just a few years ago as when I'm joining, joined with him in that eternal worship of the saints of God above and those of us below. He says, I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the scattered. I will bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. This promise is fulfilled in our worship. Let us have a healthy remembrance this Ember Friday what it is we do and why we do it and who we represent in doing so. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.